Right along, uh, we want to thank our next guest for coming and visiting us tonight, uh, Jason Smith. We'd like to come, invite you to come up and say a few words, and hopefully, we'll take some questions from the crew here. Thanks. It's uh, truly uh, great to be at the, the Cape County Tea Party. Um, was able to make your your uh, Tea Party forum back in the summer, so it's nice to. Beecher meeting. My name is Jason Smith. Uh, to give you a little bit, a little bit of a background about myself, I'm the fourth generation owner of our family farm, a small business owner, and also I'm the speaker pro tem in the Missouri House of Representatives right now. Um, I'm the Republican nominee for Congress. Uh, a lot of naysayers may may look at me and say, "Hey, you know, this guy is a young guy. He's 32 years old." Um, he may not have the experience that's needed in Washington. What I say is Washington has a lot of experience. <laughs> and that's exactly where we're headed, in the wrong direction. You know, I don't have the experience of racking up over a trillion dollar deficit. I don't have the experience of passing over 170,000 pages of rules and regulations um, that burden our family farmers and our small businesses and our individuals. I don't have the experience of passing a health care bill that I haven't read. That's the experience of Washington, and that's what we're all fed up with. And that's exactly why, why I'm running. I'm running for several reasons. I'm running because I'm tired of watching Washington not genuinely solve their problems. They continue to kick the can down the road, whether it's a fiscal cliff crisis in January 1, or not passing a farm bill, just keep extending it. Um, whether it's just continuing to rack up, rack up our debt, Folks, if you just look back in history, in the early 80s, you know, our, our national debt was just at a trillion dollars. Just at a trillion. I mean, that sounds like it's one of these little pieces of paper up here. But now we're at $16.4 trillion, just 30 years later. We continue to increase the debt limit. We've increased the debt limit over 70 times since 1962. Folks, that's a huge problem. And we have to do something about it. You know, we need to pass a budget. That's a good start, you know. Um, we haven't even passed a budget in four years, let alone balance one. Um, we've only balanced a budget, in fact, five times in the last 56 years. You know, what I think is, is that we actually need to take the Missouri approach and actually do what we do in Missouri in Washington. We actually have to balance a budget at the state capitol. You know, that's, that's what we're beholden by the Constitution. Um, we have a triple-A bond rating in Missouri. What does Washington have? They have $16.4 trillion in debt. You know, in, in Missouri, I passed a, a bill last year, House Bill 1135, that put a systematic review process to eliminate the size of government, to eliminate regulations that cause burdens on small <coughs> business owners, that can be more narrowly tailored to carry out the purpose that actually will be taken off the books if it's obsolete. When I started that process, there were 6,281 different rules and regulations of January of last year. There were rules on the books that said, if you had a small business, you had to have a landline phone. Folks, that's outdated. I mean, who needs that? At the federal level, there's over 170,000 pages. Not rules, pages of rules and regulations. You know, like the gentleman was talking about, the executive branch. You know, Obama said last Tuesday something in the state of the state. If, if you all watched it, it's one of the things that we all should be upset about. He was talking about climate change. And he said that if Congress can't pass something this time around, he'll do it himself. I mean, that should scare everyone to death. There's three distinct branches of government. The problem is, is there's been a lot of lazy legislators, state and federal, that when they have passed legislation, they just give the executive branch such broad authority to promulgate rules, where they have the authority to promulgate cap and trade or whatever, whatever it is. What we need to do as legislators is pull that authority back. You know, politicians, you see a lot of folks in D.C., they love the power. Why are they giving the power to the presidency? I, I don't understand that. I mean, that doesn't make sense. What we need to do is put a moratorium on all new rules and regulations at the federal level until we have a process set in place to review all the rules and regulations that we have. Put those two million, million bureaucrats to work other than defense and postal service.
to actually check to see what rules are on the books that are causing a burden on small family farmers and, and business owners. That's the kind of stuff we need to do in Washington, D.C. Um, it's going to take a lot of work. It's not something that's going to happen overnight, you know, but, but it can happen. You know, I, I, I look at the, the, the example that there were two, two brothers, in fact, that had the vision of flying a plane. The first time they attempted it, they flew 102 feet. 44 years later, we broke the sound barrier. 22, 22 years after that, we put a man on the moon. So it just takes a few people that just keep chipping away, and finally we might be able to do something. And hopefully that will, that will bring a big avalanche to actually make a difference. And that's, that's why I'm running, is to try to make a difference. You know, there's, there's over 750,000 people in this district, and we all have 750,000 opinions. But what I can promise you all is that I'm going to work the, the best I can, and where we agree, let's work together. Where we disagree, let's find where we agree. And let's, let's try to get something done for the better of our country and for our state. So I'd be happy to take some questions. What do you see as the biggest barrier to improving things in this country which is in the, in the um, area of spending? What's the biggest barrier? The biggest barrier is, is the, the past track record of not passing a budget. I mean, four years of not even passing a budget, let alone balancing it. If you look back, just the amount of revenue that's coming in right now, you could take that amount and virtually almost pass a budget from what we were spending in 2006 and 2007. It's a spending problem, exactly what you're referring to. It's not a revenue problem, and that's the kind of stuff we need to look at. I mean, last year or two years ago, we spent over $140 million to subsidize farmers in Brazil, cotton farmers in Brazil. Why are we subsidizing farmers in other countries that are competing with our farmers right here in southeast Missouri? I mean, you're going to have to get serious of it. And when you look at budgeting and balancing the budget, you're going to have to look at everything. I mean, there's waste in everything. Why are we helping Brazil find oil? Good question. That's what, that, I mean, why are we subsidizing Venezuela? You know, the same thing. I mean, we need to take care of home first before we even start distribution looking of at wealth. something else. But I mean, there's a lot of, lot of different issues got to look at. And it's going to take a lot of time. Believe me. Yes? Why is the Republican <coughs> establishment playing housing wowsy with the Democrats? That's what I came under. See, I don't know what the Republican establishment is, to be honest with you. I've heard well, that word. Uh, speaker of the House oh, for one, Boehner for one. Now, what I have a problem with, and I'm the Speaker Pro Tem of the Missouri House, we would never, in the Missouri House, pass a piece of legislation that the majority party didn't support. You know, there's 109 of us, and to pass anything in Missouri, you have to have 82 votes. If we didn't have 82 votes within our party, we're not going to bring it up. You know, the fiscal cliff crisis that passed on January 1, it was so disappointing that it passed with only a third, a third of the Republican majority party supporting it. And two-thirds of them were opposed to it. But it passed because all the Democrats, virtually all the Democrats, not all of them, but virtually, and then one third of the Republicans passed it. I think that is a sign of a bad direction of leadership. And I think that's the kind of stuff that needs to change. I, I don't trust the, the, the present leadership right now. It was a bad direction in that issue. Yeah, I've not worked with the leadership, so I don't know. But um, I might be able to answer that better if you send me up there so I can see how they are. But yeah, but they have a problem with the uh, uh, lo local congressman like yourself to be, hopefully. You go up there and they soon browbeat you down. You know, you know, I've served in the Missouri House. I was the youngest elected member of the Missouri House at 25 years old. Now I'm the most senior member at 32. You know, there's no one that's been there longer than me, which is crazy. And you know what? There's been many times I've stood up against my party in what I believe in. One of it was an issue that was actually discussed here, the use, use tax. That's a controversial issue, but the Constitution is very clear with the Hancock Amendment that if there's a tax increase, it has to be a vote of the people, not a vote not to have it. That, that's like having the constitutional amendment they had a few years ago saying, well, if the General Assembly refuses to accept a pay increase, you know, by two-thirds within set, set amount of time, then they won't have it. I mean, that kind of stuff is just, it's just wrong, you know. Um, 
but it, it's going to have to be someone willing to stand up for what they believe in. And you know what? You can disagree with someone respectively, oh, yeah. you know, and, and with courtesy. What you have to do to be effective either at the state level or even in D.C. is to build relationships with and find those places where you can work with them. But when you disagree with them, let them know, but do it in a respectful way. And, and you can get that across. Except I've been able Boehner. to do it in Jefferson City. Except with Boehner. <laughs> I've never worked with Boehner, so I can't. You know, we'll, we'll figure I hope I have the opportunity to figure that out. So, yes. The Speaker of the of the House, are you familiar with the Compact for America? And if so, can you tell us what the status of it is? I'm not familiar with, with what it is. Well, it's uh, a movement, I guess you would call it, you know, came out of the Goldwater Institute to form a constitutional convention in Dallas, Texas, on July 13th or July 4th of this year. And they're trying to get 38 state legislators, or governors, uh, to send a representative that all this has been pre-approved. And what their their main purpose, or they say their main purpose is, is to pass a budget amendment, balanced budget amendment. But the fear is that under Article 5, that once they open up this can of worms, they can do great harm to our Constitution. Yes. Now, there's been a resolution in the past that I know that you're talking about. It, it's very similar to that, is to try to you know, ask Congress to, you know, call for a, ba a balanced budget it's all amendment. Part of the, plan. The, the scary part of it is if you do that, there's a lot of fear that it opens up the entire Constitution and then you'll have just a, a runaway. And right. that's a huge, huge issue. Right. What we need to do is just pass the balanced budget amendment through through the way that every other, mm -hmm. you know, amendment to the well, Constitution. If they've ignored changed. every other part of the Constitution, why would they observe a balanced budget amendment? You know, I... That's a good point. When you look, California also has a balanced budget amendment. I mean, I mean that. I mean that's something to look at. Um, what a lot of elected officials sometimes they will use the borrowing power to try to balance the budget through bonding, um, which is unfortunate. But you can see that. So, you know, they're the ones that whenever they swear to uphold the Constitution, they're supposed to be doing it. Well, just as a concerned citizen, I would urge my legislators to do all they can to avoid this constitutional convention that the Compact for America is calling for. I, I don't see the Missouri House pushing for that. I can't speak for the other side of the building, but I don't think the Missouri House will. Yes. I'm from St. Francis County, and uh, we had a member of the Republican Party Tea Party is held with more disdain by the uh, main fundraiser of the Republican Party than the Democrats. If you're a Tea Party candidate, what Tea Party meant, what local Tea Party uh, organization do you belong to? And what main Tea Party issues are you involved with? Um, I'm a Jason Smith Republican. I'm not saying I'm a Tea Party candidate. I'm not a I, I'm a Jason Smith Republican, so um, I've been asked numerous times, are you a Tea Party candidate? Are you a, a liberty-minded candidate? Are you an establishment candidate? You know, I'm who I am, you know. Uh, do I attend Tea Party rallies? Yes. The Raleigh Tea Party, I've attended every year that, that I've been there. Um, do I go to different Tea Party clubs? Yes, I have. I'm, I'm not a member of the Cape Tea Party, but I've been to their candidate forum. I've been here. Um, yeah, you know, but but I agree with the ideology of the Tea Party a lot, you know. But I'm I'm a Republican because I believe in limited government, fiscal responsibility, personal liberty. I mean, these are the the core values of what I believe in. I don't feel like I need to have a label of saying that that I'm an establishment Republican or I'm a Tea Party Republican or I'm a liberty-minded Ron Paul Republican. It doesn't matter. I mean, we need to break all these different factions and actually come together and try to make our country better. And that's what my goal is.
see this one with more, you know, I'm on Facebook, but I have had a bunch of people bugging me. So you ask. I'm good, because I would like to I would like to be able to answer them. So the question is, is that there was a couple of votes in the United Missouri House about the China hub in St. Louis and also the Obama exchanges. And I would appreciate your uh, you know, kind of telling us about how you voted on those two missions and you know, kind of just talking about why you voted for you did. Good. Um, yes, the, the, I'll start with the health care exchanges. Um, it, it passed out of the House 158 to 0. Not one member voted against it. And I did vote in support of it. But the reason why I did is we were in the process of trying to stop the governor from implementing Obamacare by executive order. And we were also trying to pass Prop E through the process to get it on the ballot so that the only way that health care exchanges could ever be created in the state of Missouri is by a vote of the people or by the General Assembly. And that's what we just passed on in the past. And we also put a provision in that bill that said that if the health care law became unconstitutional or was ruled unconstitutional, that all of Missouri would be thrown out. And so it was a safeguard to try to protect and box in the governor. You know, not because I support Obamacare, because I don't support Obamacare. But a lot of people viewed that that vote, you know, would be considered as implementing Obamacare. Right now, the only people that can implement Obamacare through the health care exchanges in Missouri is the General Assembly or a vote of the people, and we're not doing it. You know, so that's... that's the, the China Hub aspect, I voted against it. Um, whenever it was just the China Hub. When I voted for it, there was an amendment, there was two amendments in fact on it. One was my amendment, and one was another one. It was in the special session of 2011. And one provided a tax decrease of half percent for all businesses in the state of Missouri. And whenever you're legislating, you have to look, does the good outweigh the bad? And to me, cutting taxes for every business in the state of Missouri by half percent was more important than that junk that was within the China Hub. And I was hoping that the China Hub would get pulled out of it. The other amendment that I put in there was creating a sales tax holiday for the month of July for any products that were made in America where it would pay no sales tax on it. I think those are the kind of things that we need to incentivize instead of just picking different you know, special project, projects of winners and losers. But when you look at making legislation, there's it's like sausage. I mean, and hopefully, you got to outweigh the good and bad sometimes when it goes. And, and I got painted as being a, a horrible person for those two votes. But last year, the American Conservative Union, you know, tracked every legislator in the state of Missouri for the first time in its history. We didn't even know they were tracking us. And only seven, seven legislators out of 163 got 100% rating with the American Conservative Union. And I was one of the seven. You know, so, I mean, I feel like I'm pretty consistent at being being conservative, and I, I think I'm conservative, but out of the 7,000 votes I've taken in the Missouri House and, and now going into my eighth year, there's votes that I look back and think, that's probably not the, the best one, and I'm willing to admit it, you know, but my, my goal is to represent what best represents my core values and represents the area that I'm representing, and that's, that's what you have to do. So... I enjoyed serving with Miss Mary Caston as well, too. It's good to see you there, Mary. <laughs> you know, I actually have a picture of Mary and I whenever um, it was the youngest member and the, the, um, the other member. <laughs> Most seasoned member. It was wonderful. Yes, most respected. So... Oh, yes. Hi, Jason. Uh, thanks for coming, by the way. I uh, appreciate you coming. Um, got an opportunity to see you the last time, speak with all the other individuals to uh, pitch your ideas in regards to getting voted in. If you get voted in, all right, what are the top three things on your mind that has been going around in there for the past few weeks that you want to take care of? Specifically, different policies. three things that you can think of that have been either driving you or in your gut. One thing that is a huge, huge deal with me is regulation reform. I mean, I've done it at the state level. It's something that we need to do at the federal level. When you talk to small businesses, family farmers, or anyone, they always talk about these horrible 
federal regulations that's destroying our way of life. Whether it's the child farm labor laws that the Department of Labor tried to promulgate or, or any various laws. I, for example, today I was down in Dexter um, talking to the rice growers and they're worried about the FDA trying to create a rule and regulations in regards to arsenic and rice. You know, so you, as you can see, it, it would drastically affect affect our region in this area. So it's all the different rules and regulations. We need to put a moratorium on the rules and regulations. Mm -hmm. We need to set in a systematic review process and allow us to go in and sunset these rules and regulations. It's causing an undue burden. Can they be more narr narrowly tailored to carry out the purpose? Um, are they obsolete? That's the first one. You know, and this is not top to bottom, whatever, first, second, third. The other one is is getting our fiscal house in order. That's something we've been talking about over and over. I mean, we have to start cutting the wasteful spending and be a, a very watchful eye of, of, of countering that. We need to pass a budget. And the third one, one we need to rein in the executive branch. And the way that you do that is start pulling away the power that they have. And that's the things that you have to do. I mean, we've, we've granted them a lot of broad, broad authority, you know, to allow the EPA to promulgate these rules or the USDA. We need to start pulling in this, this authority. Those are three things yeah, that I think if you can do that, it's going to another thing, another thing that I feel very adamantly about is reforming a lot of the welfare programs because the structure of the welfare programs in our country makes it where it, it, it makes people more reliant on it, mm -hmm. and there's no way to break it off. You'll see somebody who's an able-bodied adult that's that's working part time, but they know how many hours that they can work to still get the maximum benefits. Mm -hmm. But if they work over that, they'll start losing certain you know child care subsidies or whatever the welfare benefits are. We need to change that structure because how that structure works right now, it only makes people to feel like they have a security blanket and to stay more reliant on the federal government. We need to change that focus to actually incentivize people to work themselves off the system. I mean, it needs to be focused on a hand up instead of a hand out. And I think that's actually true. So to reiterate what you stated, you stated that you want to reform the regulations within Missouri, farming for example. You want to get your fiscal house in order by probably trying to eliminate some of the federal money coming into the state and uh, also the executive branch, and also the welfare reform to tweak in some of the regulations and try to eliminate all this money coming in from the feds. Is that, is that, is that what I'm hearing? We need to get our fiscal house in order, and I didn't say to take the money from Missouri. What I said is, is to, to balance a budget and pass a budget, and it's going to affect Missouri, but it's going to affect all of the other 49 states. So I'm not just pinpointing just Missouri. But you know what? To actually balance a budget, to live within your means, it's going to affect everyone. And that's what we're going to have well, to do. Well, I agree, but you also got to get your own house in order first. Absolutely. And if I'm elected, the house is in Washington, D.C., and that covers the whole country. <laughs> uh, yes. Do you have any idea why the USDA Agriculture Department and different uh, ones are, 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 are stocking up on millions of rounds of ammunition. PowerPoint. I don't. I don't know about that. I have. I don't. I don't know about that. You so, know I, I. I don't know why they're doing it or what they're doing. I mean, I have no idea. Why are they buying millions? I don't, I don't, I have no idea. I'm not up there. You know, I don't, I have no idea. Yeah, I, no, I mean, I'm talking Yeah, I don't know. But I'm, I'm, I mean, thank you for having me. I'll be happy to stay after and answer any other questions that you have. Yeah, we'll go ahead and wrap up the meeting and then uh, you can uh, hang out and uh, shoot crap with folks. So thanks so much for coming. Appreciate it.